Welcome to Knowing and Understanding C.S. Lewis YouTube channel. I'm William O'Flaherty. Today is the second of a two-part interview with Holly Ordway about her biography entitled Tolkien's Faith. While Tolkien is more well-known, he was friends with C.S. Lewis. We begin in the second part with Holly finishing answering the question about the middle section in her biography that covers a 40-year span not often explored. You'll hear about the last two minutes from the previous episode. And I, I find that really moving. You know, his faith was not just something that cruised along st steadily throughout his whole life. Here we have a, a stretch where he's, he's really struggling. Um, and and he, he pulls out of it and then becomes really a, a role model to other Catholics at Oxford, uh, something I explore a fair bit, you know, looking at his academic vocation, the way that he's actually really very present and visible as a Catholic in Oxford in ways that have been almost totally overlooked, I think, by, by the scholarship. So I find that very interesting. Um, and then, you know, earlier, William, we were talking about the way that, you know, Catholicism was very much the, the minority religion. It was not socially approved. There's a lot of tensions between Catholics and non-Catholics, between Catholics and Protestants. And I think having that context helps us better appreciate the fact that Tolkien became great friends with C.S. Lewis. When right. Lewis, Tolkien meet, Lewis is an atheist. And Tolkien helps him to become a Christian. And of course, Lewis doesn't become a Catholic. He he rejoins the you know the, the Church of England, but Tolkien was not bothered by that. You know, he he had a recognition. You know, obviously, he would have liked for Lewis to become a Catholic, um, but he had a recognition that Lewis was his brother in Christ. He speaks very warmly of how you know Lewis loves the Lord, and that this is a grace that brings more graces. He speaks about how Lewis's friendship has done him good spiritually. And this is something kind of remarkable for that era. And we take it for granted, I think, in these kind of happier, more ecumenical times. And then there's the Inklings, which are a really mixed group of Catholics and Protestants. And they didn't shy away from talking about religious topics. You might think, like, oh, that's how they kept the peace. They just talked about literature. They never talked about religion. Wrong. Hmm. They really went at it hammer and tongs, um, disagreeing vehemently often. And they remained friends. And I think this is a real testament to Tolkien's big heartedness. That was very much a quality that I discerned as I was doing the search. He had all of these friends who were not Catholics. He had friends who were not Christians. He himself was very deeply grounded in his faith. He was a convinced Catholic, but he was very willing to recognize that God was working in the lives of other people in ways that, you know, he didn't maybe understand. Um, and I think in this, he's very much following the example and the teaching he got from his oratorian fathers. The They, mostly Catholics, mostly converts themselves, had from the beginning helped him not to be defensive, helped him not to be afraid of Protestants, but to in interact with them, you know, on equal footing. And he's really practicing ecumenism, you know, decades before the Catholic Church and the Second Vatican Council really formalized this as, you know, as a doctrine. And I think that big hearted quality of Tolkien's faith is something that I want everybody who reads this book to, to take away from it. Hmm. And I, I believe it does definitely um, shine through there. Well, now, before covering the final third of your book, uh, let's consider those extra elements that I've made reference to a few times. Uh, tell us about some of the photos and why you have two appendices and what other additional content the reader will find. Yes, well, it was great fun to put this book together. And it felt, I feel like Tolkien would approve. I've got not one, but two appendices. <laughs> I, think he would, I think he would approve. Um, so I'm very proud of the photo gallery. It's massive. It's 40 pages. Oh, wow. There's more than 72 images um, comprising, you know, a, a sort of visual walk through his entire life from, you know, from where he was baptized, um, the Anglican Cathedral, I have an image of that, all the way through to um, his gravestone and the last photograph that was that was taken of him. 
And I wanted to be able to show people what the world of his faith looked like, you know, because we can we can picture things like, you know, him in a tweed jacket smoking a pipe. We can picture him at the eagle and child having a pint with his friends. But can we picture him going to church? You know, it, it's maybe harder. So I wanted to show that, show show his life. And I'm very excited, you know, to have pictures here that have never been published before. Um, there, for instance, there's a photograph of his mother Mabel's baptismal certificate as a Catholic that has never been printed before. There's a picture, a photograph of the attic chapel that he went to as an undergraduate at Exeter. Um, he's a little cramped. Um, literally, it's in an attic. Uh, there's um, pictures of various people that he knew who were important to him, um, the other Catholics at Oxford things like that. And the places he worships, St. Aloysius, um, St. Gregory and Augustine, um, trying to really give a picture of, of his world. And I think it's great fun. And I really appreciate the fact that uh, in the advanced reader's copy, it did include the pictures, the images, because sometimes when I get advanced copies, it just says insert images here. And I was like, oh, wow, I got to wait. But uh, that is, a, you know, I was uh, looking back over it yesterday, uh, not, not remembering how many you had. I'm thinking, yeah, you got 20, 30, but no, you got over 70. So that's a, a great amount. Uh, but uh, go ahead and share some about the, the other uh, extra m materials that are there in the back. Well, we have two appendices and the first appendix is a timeline because, you know, as we noted, this book is just about his spiritual life. And there's obviously a lot else in his life that we should know about. And there's a lot going on in the world. So I constructed this timeline so that readers can kind of place things in context. There's, you know, the, all the events of his life, but also on the other side, um, major events going on in the world. So at any point, any reader who wants to know, okay, well, where are we in Tolkien's life? What's going on? Can turn to the Appendix A, the timeline, and say, okay, that's where we are. So it's a bit of a, of a handy reference. And then the second appendix is prayers and liturgical extracts. And the reason I included that is that there are many things that Tolkien refers to that there's absolutely no reason that the reader would know what they are. So, you know, he talks about, for instance, um, the Magnificat, which is a particular Catholic prayer that's drawn from scripture. Well, what's the Magnificat? How would you know? Well, it was something that Tolkien knew. Um, you know, how, how would you know what he means when he talks about the canon of the mass? It's something he had memorized. So that's obviously important to him. He had the whole thing memorized. Well, what did it say? Uh, it's really important to his spiritual life. Why would anybody know? Well, it's in there. And I made sure to put everything in cultural and chronological context. So Tolkien himself would have known these prayers in Latin. He, he, he liked to pray to God in Latin. That was his preference. Um, he also, for instance, read the Bible and, and had prayers in English, but he, he liked to pray in Latin. So I've got the Latin um, in a column, Latin on one side, but then English translation on the other. But I made sure every English translation is from a text that was from Tolkien's era. So for instance, the Canon of the Mass, the English translation is taken from a 1916 edition published in London, um, because I really wanna get as close as possible to what Tolkien knew. So we know that he had certain Psalms that he knew by heart and recommended to know by heart. Well, I've got them. And I made sure to get them from the Douay translation, which is the translation that he would have been using as a Catholic in that era. And I think this helps us to get a little bit closer to his experiences and even to get a sense of the kind of literary influences from the language of the Bible that is, is coming out of these. So again, this is just to help people to really get a sense of the, of the substance rather than just the name. Okay, well, it's it's a psalm. Which psalm? Um, it's the, the canon of the math. Well, you can look in Appendix B if you want to, and there you'll find it. And then I also have a, a glossary because, you know, as I noted before, I don't expect the reader to be a Catholic. I don't expect the reader to be a Christian. I want every reader to be able to understand what Tolkien is talking about. So I have this quite extended glossary with loads of terms in it. 
that you can look things up. So if you're coming along, you're reading along and you see maybe the word deacon or curate and you think, what, what is that exactly? You can flip to the big glossary and oh, that's what it is. <laughs> and that way there aren't any obstacles in between understanding what Tolkien was saying. And I think I want to help people just get closer to Tolkien. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, uh, again, I believe you, uh, yeah. And the different uh, goals that you had, and uh, I think you did accomplish that uh, part as well. Well, now the final section is, you know, only 11 chapters, but it, and it covers a, a little more than the last 20 years of, of his life. Now, um, tongue in cheek here, why isn't it just about the Lord of the Rings? <laughs> and then re reveal some of what the details you uh, cover. Well, obviously the Lord of the Rings in a sense dominates this this last section because he has now moved into you know becoming the world famous author of this of this great book and that's the chapter that I that I start with um, and I start the the title of the of the first chapter of the section is I have exposed my heart to be shot at which is a quote from one of Tolkien's letters as he's anxiously awaiting the publication of the Lord of the Rings and one of the things I think that's interesting about this section is to see that it's coming at a point of a lot of different transitions in his life. It's coming, you know, near his retirements. He retires, you know, shortly after the uh, the Lord of the Rings has come out. You know, it's it's in his older years. So there's a lot of changes going on in his life, and I think knowing that helps us kind of appreciate what what kind of an accomplishment the Lord of the Rings was. It's really the fruit of his mature. Um, life and his mature creative imagination. Um, and there are lots of books that, you know, that go into the Lord of the Rings in, in great depth and, and I'm not trying to compete with those. So I didn't spend a lot of time looking at, you know, the themes in the Lord of the Rings or anything like that, but I wanted to look at what else is going on in his life. And so this is a section where I look a lot at his relationships with his non-Catholic friends you know, how did he relate to them? Um, it's often sort of assumed that he didn't do any evangelization. He didn't do any witnessing because it's his great friend, Lewis, who's the apologist and the evangelist. Um, and, and Tolkien, maybe not so much. But I found that he he did share his faith. He just did it on a more personal level. He, he, he just didn't feel called to do the kind of public evangelism that Lewis did. He knew his own limits. But I explore in this chapter called Bearing Witness, I explore the way that he one-on-one -on -one would talk over matters of faith with, you know, other people. For instance, with Warney Lewis, um, you know, who we had conversations about Catholic doctrine with. Now, Warney never became a Catholic, but it's, it's pretty clear that their conversations helped Warney to overcome certain stereotypes about Catholics you know, and have a sort of more positive impression. So this is a very positive outcome, you know, from this this conversation, this from Tolkien. And then there are really interesting things like the way that he translated a book of the Bible, hmm. you know, in the 1960s. This is late in his life. Um, and the, trans the editor of the um, Jerusalem Bible in English, there was a French version, they're making an English translation. The editor of the Jerusalem Bible loved the Lord of the Rings and thought, oh, wouldn't it be marvelous if we could have a translation of the whole Bible from the author of the Lord of the Rings? And then realistically <laughs> said, that's never going to happen. But he asked Tolkien if he would contribute and Tolkien said, yes. And I think this is really important because Tolkien um, was participating, therefore, in an English translation project. I mean, he loved Latin, um, you know, and that was the language he knew well, but he had absolutely no objection to English being used for the Bible, for people reading the Bible in English. Um, and he's eager, in fact, to participate in this translation project. And what's even more remarkable is he's, he's tasked with writing Jonah and he finishes it. And anyone knows Tolkien is like, what? He actually <laughs> finished this. He submitted it on time. Whoa. <laughs> I know this is absolutely <laughs> astonishing. Um, and it's, it's, it's really delightful to know that, you know, he, he wrote this this translation of Jonah. And it was interesting to see what he took away as the theme of Jonah. He wrote to his, his grandson that he felt that one of the themes of Jonah was God's mercy and pity. Because Jonah's the character, you know, the figure of Jonah in, in, in the book is 
he doesn't really want to be, you know, evangelizing to uh, people of Nineveh. He's a bit, you know, sort of irritated that God is choosing to give them the opportunity to repent. repent. Why doesn't God destroy them? But God wants him to preach to the Ninevites and they repent and, you know, and that's, that's all good. And Jonah sulks. And so <laughs> Tolkien's takeaway was that God is more merciful than sometimes his own sort of ecclesiastical people are. And that's really the theme, you know, that he emphasized. And of course, mercy and pity are really important themes in the Lord of the Rings. And so we can see a kind of a consistency and a coherence in Tolkien's spiritual life, you know, in, in how he was viewing the themes of Jonah, in how he's evoking this important Christian virtue in the Lord of the Rings. Well, now, speaking of Jonah, then, is there... Um... Uh, you know, it, it's not very common, and Jonah obviously is a very short book, but uh, is there enough um, extra things that uh, uh, Tolkien commented about Jonah to have a standalone book of, here is the Tolkien translation of Jonah with commentary by uh, by him? Um, no, but there is a um, edition of an, a journal issue of the Journal of Inkling Studies that presents Tolkien's translation. Um, and Brendan Wolf um, edited that piece and did a fantastic job of providing the context. And I, I draw on, on Brendan Wolf's um, work and on that translation to, in that edition in in this chapter. So readers can go you know, to the uh, back issues of the Journal of Inkling Studies and find Tolkien's Jonah, the original text as Tolkien wrote it, which isn't exactly the same as it appears in the Jerusalem Bible, because the editors did you know, make some edits. Um, it, apparently, Tolkien was happy with the edits. He, he he didn't complain about them. But it's still nice to be able to go back and see the, the this is the version that Tolkien prepared. So, And that get, allows me to give a plug for the Journal of Inkling Studies, which is a fantastic journal. Everybody should, uh, who's interested in Lewis and Tolkien should, uh, should know about this. Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, I will have a link in the show notes, and I had forgotten that uh, that was uh, available there. Well, now, in terms of like sharing faith and, you know, being uh, as evangelistic as, as Lewis, um, I, I'm sure it's obvious to, to people that, you know, in, you know in, in a very real sense, if you think about it, the fact that he was influential in Lewis returning to the faith, that that's being very evangelistic, and that's very much of sharing, you know, faith and stuff. But I wanted to point out something else that um, I had a a friend years ago uh, comment or or had the misunderstanding. Uh, you know, I'm of course known for correcting people about uh, misquoting or you know uh, Lewis or you know misattributing here, but this person thought Lewis helped convert Tolkien and not the other way around. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that uh, misunderstanding? Well, that's a, it, it's got the it's got the wrong way around. Um, Tolkien didn't need converting; it was he who helped Lewis to become a Christian. But there's a germ of truth there, and I think it's worth noting that you know Tolkien, when he met Lewis, was just starting to come out of this barren stretch. Um, and I really think, and I say this in the book, that I think that his discussions with Lewis undoubtedly helped him to renew and strengthen his faith. You know, iron sharpening iron. Lewis, superbly intelligent, you know, you know, ready to have a discussion. And, uh, you know, there's a recollection of them like they were like bear cubs wrestling with each other. They had this lively dynamic friendship and they used to talk for hours Um and I really think that, you know, Lewis, with his his keen, inquisitive mind, he's looking into Christianity. He's looking into theism first, and then into Christianity. Here's his friend Tolkien, who, who is a believer. Of course, he's going to be talking to him about that and, you know, firing questions at him. And then Tolkien has to come to grips with, well, what am I going to say to my friend Lewis? And it's often the case that when you're explaining something to someone else, you come to a firmer understanding of it in your own right. So I, I think that sort of accidentally that <laughs> that reversal <laughs> touches on a really important point. And I in and we owe then to Lewis's, you know, sparking these conversations, Tolkien's wonderful poem, Mythopoeia, which is so little known. Um, the the full text of it is available in the um book Tree and Leaf, but Tree and Leaf is only published in the UK. So most American readers have not had the complete 
poem, Mythopoeia. And it really is a poetic expression of apologetic arguments. So Tolkien really is doing some apologetics work. And this poem was written right after these conversations at Addison's Walk. So insofar as we have any record of what they talked about, it really is in Tolkien's poem, Mythopoeia. Mm -hmm. And I found it fascinating to dive into that. So yeah, I think I think there's definitely some iron sharpening iron going on <laughs> in, that, in that early friendship. Uh, very true. In fact, when I was thinking of sharing that with you, I, I remember reading what, what you commented about in terms of how Tolkien, by by virtue of you know helping uh, Lewis in terms of returning to the faith, that that in, in, increased his faith, and so there was that iron and sharpening iron. And so there's there, there's some some aspect of of, of truth to that uh, per se. But uh, anyway, we we could obviously talk a lot more about uh, your your book here, but uh, we're going to get into some other elements, but. Uh, or, or we're going to be wrapping up here. As part of that, I always like to ask some variation of, of the following question, and that is, what was the hardest aspect of writing this book, and what was the greatest joy? Well, the hardest aspect of it was absolutely the deadline, um, because I started this book right after finishing Tolkien's Modern Reading, and I had basically two years to complete it in order to get it done in time for the, the target deadline, which was the 50th anniversary of Tolkien's death, September 2nd, um, 2023. That was extremely difficult because it turns out that there was a lot to say. Um, I did not expect to find so much to write about. I did not expect to write such a long book. It unfolded naturally um, and somewhat like, oh, no, this is going to be a longer book than I thought. So just the sheer labor of bringing it to, you know, to birth as a book, it's absolutely the most intense project that I have ever done. But it was also the most incredibly satisfying and joyful project that I've ever done. It was amazing. Um, and I, I'm so grateful. I feel like that this book was a privilege, it was a gift to me to be able to write it um, and and then to, you know, to give to readers, but it was a gift first given to me um, to do. And I think what makes me most happy about it is the sense that I got of a much fuller picture of Tolkien. I mean, I already deeply admired him. I already loved him. Um, how could I think more highly of Tolkien than I did before? Amazingly, I even do. And I think it's because writing Tolkien's faith gave me an even deeper appreciation of him as a human being. You know, he he had his flaws. He admitted it. I, I saw them. You know, he had his failings. He had difficulties in his life. He had low points in his faith. He had struggles. He had suffering. And the way that he just kept going, this determination, this, this steadfastness in, in his faith, and in living out his faith, despite many challenges, I just found personally very encouraging and inspiring. Oh, very good. Well, now you you noted before, as uh, you know, in your book, you you know, reference many things, especially either uniquely Christian or aspects that are more uniquely Catholic. So you you know you you're not assuming people you know understand that or and whatnot. So in somewhat in that spirit, I'm going to awkwardly make a transition and stuff. We we have all along here assumed people know who Holly Ordway is, and so let's go ahead and cover that base and share a little bit about yourself, where people can find you online, and some of your uh, other writings. Right. Well, my my full titles, they're quite long. Um, <laughs> I'm the Cardinal Francis George Professor of Faith and Culture at the Word on Fire Institute, which is a Catholic ministry of evangelism. Um, and I do a lot of um, working with, um, you know, culture and with, uh, with you know, encouraging writers. Actually, I have a, a lot of my work within the Institute is helping writers to learn how to be better writers. I'm also visiting professor of apologetics at Houston Christian University. Um, which is an ecumenical program, and I'm very pleased and proud to retain a connection with them. I, I taught full time for them for many years, and now I'm a visiting professor. So those are my two sort of titles. And then, of course, I I am a writer. So 
I write books <laughs> um, and the most, the major one right before um, Tolkien's faith was Tolkien's modern reading, Middle Earth Beyond the Middle Ages, which I'm very pleased to say won the Mythopoeic um, Society's Scholarship Award in Inkling Studies last year. And, uh, that, and I've written other books as well. And people can find out about that and in the other books um, at my website, which is the very straightforward hollyordway.com. Go ahead and spell, uh, you know, there's Holly could be, uh, maybe not too many ways, but your last name, you can go ahead and spell that. Right. So Holly, H-O-L-L-Y, Ordway, O-R-D-W-A-Y. Oh, very good. Because yeah, this will have a, a visual component on YouTube, but also a uh, just a podcast version too. So people are just listening there. They can avail themselves of the spelling here. Well, now, uh, in closing then, uh, you know, how has Tolkien himself made an impact on your faith? You made reference to it to some extent, but let's uh, punctuate that. And then how do you hope Tolkien's faith, not just your book at Out Talks About, but, you know, what it, what his faith talks about will influence those who read your book? Well, I think, I mean, I, I've already said how, how he's personally encouraged me. And I think, you know, for readers... I have made such an effort, as we talked about, to just present this is what Tolkien believed and not to say you should believe it too. But I do think that what he believed, well, I think that is true, and I think that it's beautiful. And I, it is my hope that in seeing his life, people will, you know, if they don't know anything about Christianity, that they might be inclined to, to maybe respect it a little bit more, maybe see that it's intellectually robust, even if they don't accept it, and maybe maybe ask a few more questions. Um, maybe you get them a little bit a little bit interested. And I think for readers who are Christians, um, maybe they'll share some of the influence that it has had, you know, on me, which, you know, one of the things we we haven't touched on this, um, but one of the things that really came through for me about Tolkien was his fundamental humility. And that's a tricky virtue to talk about because people, it's hard to get an attractive picture of humility. Like, what does it mean being a doormat? Well, no. Um, and I think Tolkien's life and the influence of the oratorians, he's living out a, a, a deep humility. And I think it's very attractive. And it gives you a sense of what that might mean. You can be a world-class author and you still have this humility. And it also for me, reminded me that an ordinary life can have such an impact. You know, for most of his life, Tolkien had no idea that he was going to be this famous author. Um, but he was just steadfast in being a, a good father, a good husband, in being a good friend, in being a, a good colleague. And, you know, very few of us are going to have Tolkien level genius in writing, you know, epic fantasy works that are the best work of literature of the 20th century. But all of us have families and friends and colleagues. And I, I think that, you know, Tolkien's vision of the, like of the hobbits, they're small, they're humble, and yet their little contribution saves Middle Earth. And I think that's a, a good vision, you know, for our own lives. Our little contributions may seem very humbly hobbit-like, but we, we don't know how much impact they might be having um, in other people's lives. Ah, oh, that's an excellent way to, to end. Well, Holly, thank you again for joining me today to talk about your book, Tolkien's Faith. It's been an absolute pleasure, as always. I trust you enjoyed this second and final part of my interview with Holly Ordway about Tolkien's Faith, a spiritual biography. If you haven't listened to the first part, then check the notes for a direct link to it. Again, I'm William O'Flaherty. My podcast, All About Jack, has been around for over 10 years, and on YouTube, my channel is called Knowing and Understanding C.S. Lewis. Be sure to check out my short feature called The Latest on C.S. Lewis that focuses on timely and timeless information. Check the description or show notes for links to items mentioned in the show today. Finally, everything I do related to Lewis is centralized at the website EssentialCSLewis.com. And in case you didn't know, I've written two Lewis-themed books. The misquotable C.S. Lewis was released in 2018 and examined 75 quotations credited to him that he either didn't write or paraphrases of something he did or without the context could be misunderstood. In 2016, my enhanced study guide to the Screwtape Letters came out 
It's called C.S. Lewis Goes to Hell. Thanks again for listening, and please consider liking and sharing this episode with others. <laughs> <laughs>